And it's almost like, I hate to put it this way, but we've almost said this. It's almost like at that point, they need you worse than you need them. If you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money, because the money comes first. Now here's your host, Jay Connor. Private money for your real estate deals is everywhere. And I don't mean hard money or institutional money or getting money from the banks. I'm talking about getting private money from individuals who are just waiting to loan you money for your real estate deals. Well, my guest in this episode today has been a dear friend of mine now for almost 10 years. And like myself, Prior to him using private money, he borrowed money for his real estate deals from his local bank, and his banker at that time made the rules. But now he makes the rules. He sets the interest rate. He sets the term. He sets the frequency of payments and not the bank. My guest today is Chip Cross from Marion, North Carolina. In this episode, Chip will share how he always buys real estate with no down payment and how he went from having no private money to over $1 million in private money in a very short period of time. So if you want private money for your real estate deals, don't miss a second of this episode. Let's dive in. Well, Chip, how much private money have you raised? Thank you, Jay. It's been a million dollars total, and I can tell you how I got there, if that would be okay. Absolutely. Tell tell us how you started from the very beginning and, and how you went from no private money to a million dollars in private money for your real estate deals. Okay, Jay. A banker friend of mine referred me to uh, one of his friends, clients who had some money in the bank, wasn't happy with the return he was getting. He did not want to go into the volatility of the stock market. So he started me off with $30,000. And his rule was if we can find, you know, that I'll have to need to find a property that's 50% of value. So one of the things I didn't realize, Jay, was the power of buying with cash. So basically we were able to find something worth uh, about 60000 and bought it for 30000 And so I was working with him over about a year's time to uh, buy about 10 properties. Uh, basically, the formula was they were worth 60000 We were buying them for 30000 And then I heard about you. Uh, I live in Marion, North Carolina, in the mountains of uh, western North Carolina, between Asheville and Hickory. And you were going to be at the Charlotte Real Estate Investors Association. I wasn't able to go, but I went to one of your live events down in Atlanta and found out that you would help people raising private money. And at that time, Jay, I wasn't skilled at raising private money. (laughs) It kind of fell into my lap. So I, I got with you and you introduced me to some more private lenders. And the one thing that I did try to do was to give good customer service to the lenders that we had. And then through the contacts that you gave me, ended up being an additional 700000 Gotcha. Well, you know, you said something there a moment ago, Chip. You said your very first private lender, the first note or the first loan they gave you was $30,000, right? Yes. But you said that relationship with that private lender grew from them loaning you 30000 to where they had $300,000 that they loaned out to you. And that was over a course of how long from the time they went from 30,000 to 300,000. That was within two years, probably about a year and a half. Okay. Well, there's a big lesson right there. So what's your takeaway? What's the lesson that you're hearing? I know the lesson that I'm hearing from someone that starts at 30,000 and then ends up at 300,000. What's the takeaway on that story? That's a great question, Jay. 
They have more money to lend, probably. We have to earn their trust. We have to give them good customer service. And if we'll do that, one of the best ways to grow our our business, our private lenders, is through our current private lenders. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, you said that that very first private lender that you had was actually referred to you by a mutual connection, was referred to you by your banker, right? Yes, that's right, Jay. So so let me ask you this. So, you know, we started working together years ago. Um, you know, you had a million dollars in private money that, you know, you were using on your real estate deals. And so I can't remember. I need you to remind me. Did you end up raising any private money like totally on your own after you learned the way that I do it? Well, well, uh, again, most most of mine were contacts that you introduced me to, Jay. And then through those contacts, they ended up giving more private funds as well. So they all had more money than they told you originally. (laughs) <laughs> that they did, they did. And one thing that I would stress to anyone listening to this podcast is to earn their trust, take care of them, keep them secure, pay them on time, do what you're going to do. Because I was, I was completely amazed at how many private lenders you had, <laughs> and I was so impressed that you were able to develop relationships with that many people. But I guess part of my story is, Jay, it doesn't take a whole lot of people. I mean, I'm going to say it, I'm, I'm going to say total, I've had seven private lenders in that million dollars. And the bulk of that has come from maybe five people. So, I mean, that doesn't take a whole lot of people. Absolutely. You're right. I mean, I've got 44 private lenders right now and right at, eight and a half million dollars in private money that we're, you know, moving from projects to projects to projects. But, you know, you don't need 44 private lenders, you know, like you say, two or three uh, get you started really, really good. Um, And so you said a moment ago, Chip, that it's really important for you to earn the trust, earn the, you know, the relationship, customer service, take care of your private lenders. From your experience, how do you do that? I mean, what do you do in the relationship with a private lender that quote unquote gives customer service? How do you earn their trust? You know, what, what do you do? That's a great question, Jay. Um, one thing that's very important is that we communicate. Um, we don't have to tell them everything, but we can tell them where we are at various stages on the project of rehabbing. One, one very simple thing here is paying on time. And one thing that I do is that I have a report that my major one, uh, and by the way, I still have him, (laughs) I'm still using him. And so my major one, I do a report on, you know, how much is owed, how much the interest rate is, what his interest to date is. And then I, most of the time, he's moved out of town now, he's moved from North Carolina to Florida. And so 80% of the time, I go put the money in the bank for him and send him a receipt. Oh, nice. So, so uh, he has made, and OJ, oh, I, I need to tell you another story. Uh, Please do. I recently, I've been rolling some of these sales of these properties into another project, moving from, from, from real estate that's peaking in value to real estate that's undervalued. And one time I wasn't sure that the timing was going to work for me to do the 1031 exchange. And my son was aware of what I was doing, some different friends. Well, I made two phone calls. One of them gave $200,000. One of them gave (laughs) $100,000. Of course, (laughs) I told my son, I said, that took a lot of years to earn that level of trust, to be able to make two phone calls and raise $300,000. I ended up not needing it, but it was there in case the timing didn't work out and I had to have it to invest in in what I was rolling it into. Um, Did you do any type of real estate investing deals prior to starting to use private money? 
That's a great question, Jay. I did. I used traditional bank financing and I actually got up to the limit of how far I could go. So uh, at that time, they started limiting it. And here's another great point I would like to make. I didn't realize the power of being able to buy with cash. Right. So I never got as good a deals when I was using traditional financing as I did with my private lenders. But total over about 22 years, I've owned um, 35 properties, which is about 55 units because some of them are uh, apartment buildings, multi-unit. So now I'm in the process of trying to sell these while the market's strong. And I'm down to about, um, let's see, I'm down to about eight properties and about 15 units that because... I've been selling these while the market's strong. Right, right. Well, you know, you and I've got something in common there, uh, Chip, and that is your story is the same as mine. Um, prior to the world of private money, uh, and private money transformed big time my real estate investing business. I mean, nothing else, no other strategy, no other way I do real estate investing had a bigger impact on my business than using private money for my deals. So just like you, my first six years that I was in the business from 2003 to 2009, investing in single family houses here in Eastern North Carolina, those first six years, I relied on the bank. I mean, that's the only thing that I knew to do until I was forced <laughs> to find a better way, quicker way to fund my deals. And, you know, that's when the uh, bank shut me down. I didn't, I didn't have my line of credit anymore. And my definition of coincidence is God's way of staying anonymous. And so I would learn about private money, like right after losing, you know, my line of credit. Now, one thing you said a moment ago uh, that transformed your business uh, once you started using private money, and that was you, you said you had a limit to the amount of money that you could borrow at the local bank. But that's not the case with private lenders, right? That's right. Exactly right, Jay. So tell me the different ways that private money really transformed your business when you started using it versus, you know, relying on the local bank. What changed? What made your business so much better? What do you like about private money? And the list is long, I know. But what do you like about private money better than using, you know, traditional institutional money? You're right, Jay. The list is really long. Um, number one is the power of buying with cash because you can buy properties at a discount when you show that you can close with cash. Number two is it doesn't affect your credit score. It doesn't affect your debt ratio. Number three, the focus is more on the value of the deal than the than the person who is borrowing the money. So if it's a really good deal and you can buy it with equity um, in it already, then, you know, it's going to be a good deal for everybody. I guess number four, I should have written these down. Number four is that you're giving a good return to your private lender. You're keeping them safe and secure. So you're providing good customer service to them. And I guess number five, Jay, I know I could go longer, but number five would be you're what you just said, you're not limited by any type of debt to equity ratio or anything like that. As long as you can find a deal that's good, that it's a win-win for everybody, uh, you'll be able to make it happen. Well, and you're exactly right. And, and you know, we're, there's sort of an umbrella statement that covers all those reasons you were naming. And that is you as the real estate investor, you make the rules. You know, when we were borrowing money from the banks, the banks made the rules. The The bank made the interest, set the interest rate. You know, you set the interest rate as the borrower. Um, you set the maximum loan to value, not the bank. Um and so it just puts you in the driver's seat and gives you all this control, um, you know, for you. And it fixes your cash flow problems. You know, we can always, I mean, here's one big one. Here's a big one. And that is we can borrow always more money than we need to purchase the property. 
which means we always bring home a big check when we buy. I mean, who doesn't want to get paid to buy properties, right? And in the world of traditional lending, we always have to have what they call, quote unquote, skin in the game. We always got to bring our own money, some of our own money to the closing table. And, you know, when I first learned about private money in 2009, that was such a just a dichotomy, an opposite direction of thinking. Um, and, you know, another big reason that comes to my mind, Chip, is when you're borrowing money from the bank, you're chasing the money. You're It's like you're having to put on your seller's hat and you feel like you got to, like, sell Mr. Banker or Miss Banker to approving your loan. And in this world of private money, have you discovered the same thing I have? And that is, we don't chase the money. The private lenders are chasing us. How about you? You're right, Jay. And um, again, my hat's off to you for all the relationships that, that you have developed. And when you were say I'm going to skip just a minute before I answer your question directly, but you, you've probably encountered real estate investors like I have. They cannot make the mind shift. They think that they have to make a down payment. I have someone who's been in it. I mean, I've been in it over 20 years, you know, 22, 23 years. I've got a good friend who's been doing it that long, too. And every time he says, I've got to come up with a money down payment. And I always say, I don't make a down payment. You know, my private lenders make the down payment. Um, you know, again, uh, it's... Um, Years ago, it was kind of unlimited the amount of money that you could make uh, if you could raise the money. And that's why I came to you, because that was my constraint. I mean, I was actually buying it at 33 to 50% of value. I was buying double-wide manufactured homes on their own land for, on average, about $25,000 that were worth $75,000. So the bank had these everywhere. Now, you cannot find them now. <laughs> but so, Jay, my constraint was, you know, I thought I can buy one of these every day if I can write, if I can raise the money for it. <laughs> and that's your expertise. That's where you came in. So I want to thank you for that. Absolutely. Now. As you just mentioned, uh, one of your, or, or actually your expertise for, was finding um, manufactured homes that were affixed to land. So we call them land home deals, you know. But there's one particular mobile home story that uh, you tell uh, that you were talking about actually earlier today. So um, tell your mobile home story. I want to hear it. Okay. Thank you, Jay. Well, this particular. Um mobile home uh was i think it was twenty two thousand dollars well i was going along borrowing thirty thousand if i bought a home for twenty five thousand i didn't spend a whole lot fixing these up either but let's say on each home let's let's make the numbers round let's say i bought five homes and i ended up with five thousand extra on each home well i ended up with twenty five thousand extra dollars so with that twenty five thousand, I bought a separate mobile home. So it was like bought it was like buying it for free. And I actually gave my private lender a lien on that home, even though I didn't have to, to try to earn his trust even more, uh, because it was worth seventy five at the time. Well, I, you know the story's not perfect because I rented it for several for a few years. And they tore it up pretty bad. So when the market got strong, I rehabbed it so I could sell it. So I spent 40000 to rehab it, which is more than I had in it. But then I sold it for 140000 So I made $100,000 off that deal. And I actually rolled it into something through a 1031 exchange without going into all the details that time will tell, but I fully believe that it was 10 cents on the dollar. So I rolled it through there tax-free. And so my story is, is that something that cost me nothing ended up being worth a million dollars. <laughs> you know, they call, they call that an infinite rate of return because when you take zero and you take zero and you get any kind of return on it, then you can't calculate it. 
That's right. right? <laughs> like, you know, there's, and, and there's another way that that works. Um, so I teach my students all the time these days about using a strategy that's called arbitrage, also called leveraging an asset. So, you know, you can be talking to a potential private lender, um, you know, somebody you got a relationship with, and let's say they don't have any liquid funds right now. Well, part of the conversation can go like this. I can ask them, well, do you have equity in real estate? Do you have equity in your primary residence? You know, equity in any kind of real estate. If they do, now follow this strategy. They can go to their local bank. They can open up an equity line of credit if they don't have one. And that equity line of credit, they can now loan that money out to me, the borrower, the real estate investor, and the, um, the interest rate and the, and the uh, money they're going to pay out to their bank to where they borrowed it is going to be much less per month than what I will pay them. So guess what? They get to do what the banks call pocketing the spread. They get to pocket the spread every month and the rate of return for them is infinity. And here's why. They're loaning money out to me that's not their money. They're loaning out the bank's money right? Exactly. By leveraging that asset that they have. Um, another way to, there's two other ways that uh, a private lender can do that. They can go to, uh, if they have stocks and they like their stocks and they don't want to sell their stocks and they want to keep their stocks, their mutual funds, they can go to their stock brokerage and say, Hey, I want to open up what's called a portfolio loan and, uh, which is a line of credit. Well, that's not even credit score driven. They can leverage the asset of their stocks, open up a portfolio loan account. They can borrow up to 50% of the face value of their stocks. And now they can loan that money out to me. They're going to pay their stock brokerage a much lower interest rate than the higher rate I'm going to pay. They get to pocket the spread again. That is you can't calculate it because they're loaning money out to me from their stock brokerage. They still own their stocks. And then there's still a third way to do what's called arbitrage. If they have a whole life insurance policy, they can go borrow against that whole life insurance policy, loan me the money. I'll pay them a higher rate than they're having to pay out. Again, arbitrage, living an asset, it's called an infinite rate of return. So, you know, the possibilities are just endless when it comes to working with other private lenders and et cetera. Chip, would you say that when you are out there raising private money or it, say advice to a new real estate investor, would you say that typically you're going to raise more money through the relationships that you have by teaching people about what private money is or trying to go get private money, you know, from an existing private lender? You got any thoughts on that? Well, yes, I do, Jay. And I want to say one thing about what you just said. I have one of my private lenders who has a home equity line. Each time that I he loaned it to me, we wrote the note for $10,000 more than he loaned me. He let me pay the low interest rate, which at that time was three and a half, four percent 4%. So each time I saw it, so long story short, I've put $50,000 in his pocket that he made off of his home equity line. <laughs> so in other words... He like leveraged his equity line of credit for you to like, quote unquote, use it. And then he got paid because he had that asset to like back you up. Yes, yes. And see, borrowing power is an asset. A lot of people don't realize that. But to go back to answer your question, uh, again, you are so good at it. <laughs> I don't feel like I'm, I'm, I actually don't feel like I'm that good at it, but. I will say that probably two two approaches. Number one is giving great customer service to the ones that you have, trying to keep them happy because they usually have more money. And number two, just like you said, Jay, I really believe it's an educational process because a lot of people just don't, don't grasp the assets that they have. Just like you said, let's say their home is paid for. See, like for instance, I have a $250,000 line of credit on my house. Well, I've been able to go in and out, use that. And so I recommend to anybody to get a line of credit if they've got the, because that's an asset. You know, that, that line of credit is an asset. And so a lot of people have stocks, like you said, they have lines of credit. So it's, 
it's more educating them. And, and of course, Jay, you know, this comes from the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. It is teaching them what you can do for them. Absolutely. Well, you know, you're saying that word education reminds me, you know, Chip, I have never asked anybody for money. I've never asked a private lender to loan me money. And people ask me all the time, they say, well, Jay, how in the world have you got eight and a half million dollars in private money? You never ask anybody for money. And the answer is simple. I put on my teacher hat. And I teach people that I've got a relationship with. Maybe they're in my cell phone. Maybe they're on my email list. Maybe they're Facebook friends. Maybe, you know, I go to Rotary Club with them. I go to church with them. You know, all these different connections. And so I teach people about private money. They learn how they can earn high rates of return safely and securely. And when, and when they learn about the program, I'm not even asking them for money. They're asking me, well, what do I do, Jay? Do I write you a check? How do I get started? And the answer is no, you're not writing me any check. When I have a deal for you to participate in, then you can participate. And at that point in time, you can invest and, uh, you know, we'll get you started. And that in, that in and of itself right there, Chip, reminds me, you know, I hear other real estate investing uh, gurus, if you will. I don't consider myself a guru. I just teach other people how to do what I do. But I hear people out there saying, oh, just go get the go get the property under contract. The, the money will show up. And I'm going, what? Where, where's it going to show up from? Is it going to like, you know, fall out of the clouds or something? I would much rather, and I know you as well, Chip, I'd much rather network get, you know, get money, what I call pledged from, you know, a private lender. And then I go get them to fund a deal. And, and, you know, along with that, as far as chasing money, I don't chase the money, but, and here's another example of how I don't, I've never done what's called pitched a deal. I've never pitched a deal. And here's why I got the private lender has pledged whatever X number of dollars, hundred thousand, 250,000, whatever. And they're waiting for my phone call. By the way, I still have landlines here in Moorhead City, North Carolina. And so I call them up and I don't call them up asking them if they want to do the deal. That's like the most stupid thing in the world I could ask. Of course, they want to do the deal. They're waiting for the phone call. Well, they've told me they got X number of dollars in either investment capital or X number of dollars in retirement funds ready to put to work. And so when I call them up, and I, I mean, here's exactly what I tell them. I say, let's say, Chip, let's say, Chip, you're my, you're one of my private lenders. And I know you got $250,000 burning a hole in your pocket and you want to, you know, get that money to work. I'll call you up. And after we have a little chit chat, I'll say, Chip, I got great news for you. I can now put your $250,000 to work. And then I'll tell you where the home is located uh, that is going to be funded by your funds when closing is and the amount needed. I already know how much you got. And I just give them the facts, those four things. Where is it located? How much the after repaired value is, the funding required, and when you need to wire your funds to my real estate attorney. End of conversation. I didn't ask you if you wanted to do it. I know you want to do it because you're waiting on the phone call. And isn't that a whole, isn't that 180 degrees different than getting a deal on the contract and then trying to chase money to get it funded. I don't want to stress out like that. How about you? Jay, I agree with you 100%. And I think what's so wonderful about the way you do it is you're not communicating urgency. You're not communicating desperation. You know, because it, to me, if you get the deal first and then you call, if I communicate that urgency, that makes people want to run. And it's almost like you said, you're in the position, you, you, well, number one, you've done your homework, you've done your preparation, they know what to expect. And then when you get the deal, they're ready to move on it. And it's almost like, I hate to put it this way, but we've almost said this, it's almost like at that point, they need you worse than you need them. <laughs> well, that's true. And you know why? Because there's so much, there's so many, there's so much money on the street now. People don't know what to do with it. They sure don't want to put it in uh, the local bank and earn a quarter of a percent per year, you know, 
I come along or you come along and pay them 8%, that's 32 times more money than they can get in the local bank. Yes, Jay, that's great. So that's giving them a higher rate of return. So Chip, how do you protect your private lenders? So instead of them loaning you money unsecured, um, what kind of security do you give them to where they can like sleep at night knowing that their money is protected? Great question, Jay. As you know, the way we do it is that I never get the money. At closing, it goes to the real estate attorney. They're protected in North Carolina by deed of trust. I try to make sure there's always equity in the property. So, you know, if anything, if anything did happen and for, and for years, I tried to do it at 50% loan to value. Now, recently with the market going up, some of them have been at, at, you know, two thirds of value. Uh, But if, if anything happens to the deal, they're going to be able to sell that property and actually probably make more money than that. So um, yeah, it's just keeping them protected with, with equity in the property. Well, Chip, you know, the stuff we've been talking about, I've got it all lined out. I'm so excited in this new private money guide that I've just written, and it's called Seven Reasons Why Private Money Will Skyrocket Your Real Estate Business and Help You Build Incredible Wealth. So this private money guide will get you on the fast track to getting private money and experience the same thing that Chip and I have. And that is never miss out on another real estate deal because you did not have the funding for the deal. You can download this private money guide step-by-step on how to get it, where to get it at www.jayconner.com forward slash money guide. Again, you can download this absolutely free at www.jayconner.com forward slash money guide. Chip, when you are visiting with a new potential private lender, you've taught them about private money. Um, typically, what's your minimum amount that you're willing to accept from a private lender to make it worthwhile for you to do business with them? Jay, uh, you know, I was probably working with lower amounts than some people were because I was working with, uh, you know, the double wide manufactured home. So I guess uh, pr- the market's changed a lot since then. <laughs> and I've been more in the selling. Uh, but but, you know, I, I'm I would I would still do it in the 30 to 50 thousand dollar range if if I, if I found something in that in that category. Sure. Well, the reason I asked the question is that, you know, Since we, the real estate investor, make the rules, we're teaching people about private money, we're attracting the money to us, that's going to be one of their first questions that they ask us is, well, what is your minimum amount? Again, they always got more than they tell you, um, but since they're going to ask that question, we need to be prepared to answer that question. What is the minimum amount? I know you've been asked that question over the years, but what's your minimum, Chip, right? Yes, you're right, Jay. So, and, and, it, and it is going to be market specific. So, you know, we want to be prepared to uh, answer that question. Um, Chip, you know, someone may just be interested in doing business with you and in your business uh, or continuing the conversation with you. How can people, um, how can someone reach out to you and, and get in contact with you? Well, thank you, Jay. I'll give my phone number here. You're actually going. You're actually a real person with a real telephone number. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess I don't have as much maybe some of the other technology, but and I and I see it's up on the screen here eight two eight three one seven nine five two two, or my email is pretty easy to remember chip dot cross at yahoo dot com. But if anyone from this uh, podcast contacts me, I will I will make sure to to give them a call back and, uh, and I'll certainly appreciate hearing from anybody. Right. So uh, we'll have chips information in the show notes, his email and his telephone number. But again, uh, chips, personal number is area code 828-317-9522. Again, that's 828-317-9522. And he can be reached easily at his email chip, C H I P dot cross at yahoo.com. That's chip.cross at yahoo.com. So Chip, for someone that is 
just starting out wanting to raise private money uh, and they haven't yet before, but maybe they're a wholesaler. They want to stay in some deals. Maybe they're a new real estate investor looking to do their first deal. Maybe someone's been like you and me. They've been borrowing money from the bank <laughs> for their deals, but they want to like start making the rules and get in control. What advice would you give someone that's new to raising private money? Well, Jay, you mentioned a word earlier, and I'm going to say networking. Um, I'm also in the Rotary Club. We have a great Rotary Club in our hometown with 80 members. Um, and there's just a lot of opportunities out there with the Chamber of Commerce. But it, for each person out there, if they would just write down the people that they know, um, I, I think that they would be surprised, very much surprised at how much money would be available to them. And then, um, so I would, I would concentrate on my networking. I would, I would invest in Jay. I would get Jay's information because Jay's the master. So uh, I would, you know, having a mentor, have, I, I would invest in my education because that can save you years of trying to do it on your own. So Jay, I would wholeheartedly recommend that they work with you. I mean, how, <laughs> That can save 10 years off learning how to do it, right? Now, uh, Chip, did I ask you to say that? No, you didn't. No, you didn't. But, but let me say this. That's what I did. <laughs> I, I'm just telling people what I did because my first one fell in my lap. I knew how valuable it was, but I didn't know how to do it. So I came to you, right? <laughs> so, I mean, I recognized that, so I came to you. So networking. Invest in your education. Also learn about how to buy properties at, at with some equity in them so you're keeping your private lenders protected. And then I guess the fourth part that I would put in here, Jay, is to always give great customer service once you get a private lender because you may be able to grow your business through your current private lenders. Absolutely. Chip, thank you so much for taking um, a few minutes here with me to hang out on the podcast, Raising Private Money. Man, I appreciate you so much. And I still congratulate you on your phenomenal success. Well, thank you, Jay. It's been an honor to be with you. And I want to thank you for what you've done for me and for what you've done for others in the real estate industry, teaching them about private lending. Thank you so much, Chip. God bless you. God bless there you. you have it, my friend. Another episode of Raising Private Money. I'm Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority, and I need your help. Yes, your help. I really appreciate uh, you going over there to iTunes or on Spotify uh, and give me a five stars and also uh, take a moment just to write a quick one sentence or two sentence review on this show. And in addition to that, I would love for you to share this episode with someone, family or friend that uh, you believe this could have an impact uh, and they would enjoy this show as well. Um, be sure to like, subscribe. Uh, if you happen to be watching on uh, YouTube, be sure and click that bell so you don't miss out on any more episodes from this phenomenal, amazing podcast. I'm Jay Connor, wishing you all the best. Here's to taking your real estate investing business to the next level. And I'll see you right here on the next Raising Private Money. Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jconnor.com slash money guide. That's j-c-o-n-n-e-r.com slash money guide. And download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jconnor.com slash money guide to get your free guide. We'll see you next time on Raising Private Money with Jay Connor.